laugh at this next part. In a world of political correctness and cancel culture, comedians have risen up to prove that with the right angle, anything can be funny. This is You Can't Laugh at That. Who writes these? Huh? We should have this person locked up <laughs> and looked at. Live from Golden Ox Studios in Cleveland, Ohio, it's Steve Murs and David Horning on this week's episode. I honestly tried a lot of stuff about the actual experience, and as I'm sure you guys can attest to it, when you get into the specifics of almost anything, people like turn their brain off, sort of, because it feels like yeah. school. Like if you got a little too informational, I was like, it's sad and also educational, which is a recipe for disaster in comedy. Right. Even if there's like a killer punchline. My dad uh, saying that he was rooting for me was just like hitting so much harder than the rest of the material that I was like, all right, that is the bit that I'm going to go with. And then my girlfriend really did cheat on me, which was insane. And these things were just, I feel like, much more relatable concepts than uh, getting into the them taking my ball out and having a permanent scar kind of thing. You can't laugh at that. Welcome to You Can't Laugh at That, the podcast where we take topics you can't laugh at and we find ways to make them funny. On our quest to prove that everything can be funny. With me today, as always, mostly always, Steve Mers from space. Hey, I'm in a Tesla. <laughs> you should do that joke every Show. I l I Every literally episode. just got a text from Joe Biden, one of those creepy clingy texts. So that was that threw me off. <laughs> we're doing pod, we're doing you, podcasts, and I'm, Kamala's like, "Hey, we need to get we need to round everybody up," and and like I don't know. Are you getting me. an absentee ballot in space? Yes. How does that work? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not that witty. Um, <laughs> I like you just admitting it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the best thing you can say when you're like, well, I'm not going to be quick enough on this one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> They're dismantling the post office. They're, they've closed their International Space even, Station location. I can't even breathe. I don't think, I don't know why you think I can't, I uh, can think of something funny in the, in the moment. So that's yeah, my excuse. Right. Well, that's <gasps> funny enough. <laughs> <laughs> Joining us today from planet Earth is Matt Levy. Hello. Matt. <laughs> is a New York City based comedian. Uh, he's been featured in comedy festivals. This is right, plural. Plural, yes. Many, yeah. More than one. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know a, a ton about Matt. I do know that we met at the Cleveland Comedy Festival a couple of years ago, and then we've reconnected a few times since. Uh, we can dive into that later uh, if we want to talk about Caroline's at some point. But sure. uh, I mean, tell us a little bit about you. Oh, I just want to talk about my David Horning relationship. Um, oh, please. I love, <laughs> I love talking about me. I believe we met officially at what was called the show, but it was on the second floor of a sports bar, and there was yeah. no audience. And we were all told to do <laughs> 10 minutes for comics that did not want to be there. And yeah. it was the most insanely marketed Thing as a show in festival history <laughs> it was like unbelievable that I flew to Cleveland to be in the second floor of a sports bar I mean I understand all the work that goes into making festivals happen and it's not easy but that was shocking like it was insane and then I think the rest of the shows that I did were like okay they a few of them were like legitimately mics but yeah. uh, the Cleveland Comedy Festival was a very interesting experience. What yeah. venue was that second floor show on? Harry Buffalo on East 4th yes. Street. That's what? It. Yeah. What? And then yeah. the power was out. I was booked there again. I remember that. <laughs> that second show didn't happen. Oh. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, they had the lights on the first one. So it was like the total opposite yeah. of a power outage. Like, it felt like we were in a Denny's. Or like an IHOP upstairs. It was really, just, really yeah. strange. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, the, this past year's festival was much, much better. That was a decent one. I've I've only been to like three of those since I started like years ago. But like it's um, 
Yeah, that was a, that was pretty decent. I liked it. It's good. Yeah, they had good venues. They had that that uh, Kennedy's Theater, which I'm sure you probably performed at a couple of years yeah. ago. Is that like the competition venue where you like go downstairs in this like elegant, yeah, mm-hmm. like place that comedy should not happen? It's like yeah. this art center where you expect opera and theater and beautiful right. things to happen and politicians to be inaugurated, and then there's yeah. like a weird little den that comedy competitions happen in. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That's Kennedy's Theater. Um, I, I stayed there. I stayed at the hotel nearby that. They gave us a discount on. <laughs> nice. Oh, that's cute. That was cool. Yeah. And if it was the Hyatt or something. Yeah. Or no, they had like, yeah, they had all kinds of. It was like, uh, <laughs> there was a, a trolley that would ride right mm-hmm. past it. And right on Euclid. Yeah, no, it was, it was an interesting experience. I went to a really great tiki bar in Cleveland too. Porco. Oh, was it Porco? Porco, yeah. yes. Do you guys know Monster Rally? He's like nah. this Tropicalia musician that samples like beats from weird like 60s bossa nova stuff i'm obsessed with him i met him a month or two before the cleveland fest and he's like if you do one thing in cleveland because he's from there he's like you must go to porcos ah so he he was right that place was the shit i love porcos sampling uh, exotica music from like the that weird era of like the late 50s early 60s yes. where the whole they were obsessed with hawaii and stuff in america yes. <laughs> yeah 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 yep. i love monster rally mm-hmm. if anything we don't have to talk about me having cancer i'm happy to talk <laughs> all about monster rally me meeting him live and then saying he's not a wedding dj but he would think about it and almost did what dj my wedding like the nicest guy <laughs> the greatest music and for some reason i'm on his like labels email list and i get emails from his label i want to okay. say once a week that i delete pretty regularly oh, sounds like sounds like a classic friendship yeah man he's a good dude he has good taste in cocktails that's for sure oh yeah no yeah. Porco. yeah that place hasn't reopened yet oh no i mean it, yeah. it will they, they do okay you know they but are they doing right. like, they're not doing like the takeout kind of thing is that a thing in cleveland yeah okay. such a weird format for them but yeah i mean they could for sure because the drinks are so elaborate yeah right yeah yeah you really like 50 little things in my drink yeah yeah like little oh, flags wow. and umbrellas and stuff yeah it really yeah. takes the pizzazz out of it when it's to go you know you just you get this liquid and it's just kind of this orangish brownish liquid and you're like this will taste great <laughs> there's no there's no uh, there's no dry ice in it or anything <laughs> like it, porcos is all about presentation right yes yeah definitely this podcast is brought to you by porco uh <laughs> porco whenever this pandemic is over come back please that's their slogan <laughs> yeah. uh, no it's all about the experience man you can't you know you can't get that at home Hundred percent. All right. I miss right. businesses. Yes. Don't we all? I miss. I miss businesses. <sighs> anyway, speaking gluten. of, what's that? I, I do love gluten. <laughs> <laughs> I do love gluten. Although I'm eating a totally keto uh, lunch today, so. Oh, good. For maybe you. not that much. Yeah. Sure. I just I have pasta too. So. Huh? Who's in the background there? Oh, that's that's my lady. Oh. She just, just take care of the laundry before work, so. She works on Saturdays? Yeah, yeah, she works at a bar. Wait, Porcos? No, <laughs> I wish. Porcos? Yeah. No, she works at a, a taco place called Barrio, which maybe you went to while you were in Cleveland. That's like oh, I didn't one of the places. I whole trip eating yeah. all right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's like one of the places where uh, it's, yeah. People always recommend it to people like out of towners. It's like a build your own taco joint. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. Maybe I did go there. <laughs> you it, could be yeah. right. Yeah, it, it's pro- it was probably right around the corner from your hotel. Did you meet your girlfriend at Barrio? Yes. Whoa, you met like a bartender and hit on her and started going out with her and living with her? Yeah. It's weird, right? Dude. I still I still demand drinks. It's <laughs> <laughs> how did you how did you do that? No one ever gets to date a bartender um if you make them laugh enough you can uh, 
start a relationship i guess i don't know holy shit good yeah. for you no i knew her i knew her for like three years before we actually started dating dating uh wow yeah. three years of going back to barrio yeah it was i played the long game <laughs> 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 yeah he tips me enough okay i guess i'll keep those chips coming yeah <laughs> yeah right unlimited <laughs> come on <laughs> All right, but that's not what we're here to talk about. I feel like we've been talking about Cleveland and me, which thank you. But um, I don't today even know anything about Stephen Murs, dude. Except yeah, that not of this earth. He's not. Oh, great! So he's calling me. Oh, right. oh. I got it. No, I know it sounds like a. Disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Space is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Space is dangerous. So much professionalism happening <laughs> in these last two podcasts. Hey, we are we're we're riffing to get to know each other so we have a rapport for when we actually start talking about cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's hard when you're on a podcast to talk about the thing you're supposed to talk about. Right. It yeah. feels like, all right, now we're going into the part of the set where we're no longer allowed to riff. It's like uh, it's like when you go when you meet somebody and you know it's for a business lunch. What the and hell? And then that moment you make that that transition from small talk to all right now we got to talk business. Like the the temperature <sighs> yeah. of the room changes. Dude. So yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's all good. We Vin thought we Vince, lost you. Vince uh, called me and I didn't know which one I was supposed to deny and I denied the Zoom chat instead uh, of the call. Classic. <laughs> Yeah, I know. What perfect timing. You're like, so what's up with you, Steve? Oh, I got to go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I've been doing comedy for eight years in Cleveland. And, you know, sadly enough, you don't really know if you should be taking it seriously until like year four or five. And then I was still full time student and I had like three jobs at the time. So I didn't really start traveling until like two years ago. And I went to Chicago for the first time last year. So I'm starting to branch out to other cities. Um, and I'm enjoying it. I'm learning that bigger cities like me more than smaller towns and cities. So that's good. You're a big city guy. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that's the case because it's my only plan, really. I don't want to be a touring comic. Mm. I, don't, yeah. I, just, I just can't do it. <laughs> I get it. Matt, how long have you been performing? Um, well, from 2003 to 2005... I actually did stand up with my dad. Um, like we did classes and I think I did a few bar shows here and there, but I stopped to just do like sketch stuff. And then back in like, I want to say 2012, I started up hard again and went, I would say very hard up until the pandemic. And then I'm like, kind of good i don't really miss it all that much to be completely honest oh, yeah is that weird like <laughs> i'm kind know. of happier and i'm i mean i'm way more productive so yeah there is that i have gotten a lot fatter over the pandemic so there's that's the trade-off <laughs> of that i'm not <laughs> so keto you, like david i wish i wish oh, I i'm not I just, that disciplined i just started getting the uh green chef which is one of those like meal like Mm. I did Hello Fresh, and that is not healthy. <laughs> no, Hello Fresh is all <laughs> carbs, dude. It's, it's so good, though. Yeah. I love Hello Fresh. Should we? Do, should I do Green Chef? Uh, are you wealthy? Yeah, it's like eighty bucks. <laughs> Check it's, out the apartment. It's not. I'm okay. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. it's like almost twenty dollars more than Hello Fresh. Yeah, so, yeah. I could spring for twenty dollars more. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they give you you get a keto. Uh, option or paleo or vegetarian or i think they just have a regular one um okay we'll say they're very hasn't good. Been bad i like them a lot that's just me like i've had like a handful of different ones and they were good my mom ordered some she like let me cook them and everything and they were good does she not usually let you cook no she, i mean i'm a good cook too but she's uh this is the thing i for the first month, well, two months of the pandemic, I didn't have any income. So I just stayed with my parents. And then right. like, that was nice. Cause then they just like made me cook all the time, which I don't mind doing. And it was kind of like a trade off, you know? Right. And, uh, and it was good. Like my mom got some green chefs and they were, they were good. Like I liked them a lot. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I should be doing like the free month trial of every single one of them. Yeah. Right. 
There's so many options. I know. So many meal uh, plans. Yeah. I also do Freshly, which is just like a gourmet, like TV dinner. Mm -hmm. You just heat it up. That one just feels lazy. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm done with Freshly. But Great Chef. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about switching to purple carrot. They do they do vegan stuff. <laughs> I mean, purple carrot. It. Yeah. Cleveland. My, I grandpa, know, right? my grandpa got a purple carrot in the army. <laughs> <laughs> hey. And and vegan food is good uh for avoiding cancer. You see that segue right there? Whoa! Whoa! Ah, <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> Boom! I, I knew I could find a a, a thread. They should call it "Hello Cancer." Yeah. <laughs> Hello Cancer. Dude, we did we did all the advertisements for like you know Blue Apron, but just free of charge. There, you don't yeah. you're not a sponsor for the show or anything. It just <laughs> happened organically. Right. We named so many companies that have big boxes that sell to people for no and benefit for you whatsoever. No benefit <laughs> at all. Oh. <laughs> I should I should definitely hit up Green Chef and be like, listen, because they they pre-cut their bell peppers, which makes them go bad so fast. Dude, that, I didn't know that was a thing, but yes, you're so right. They just I, cut I it down the middle. It's like, why, why? I can cut it myself. Why? Right, right. <laughs> Onions should be pre-cut, but bell peppers cut yourself. Yeah, they yeah. do, and that's the trade-off: is the onion comes diced already. For the Sadly, yeah. So I want to do my own dicing. What do they don't? They don't trust me with a knife. I know to tuck mm -hmm. my fingers. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, all right, the topic at hand, Matt. Cancer. Yeah. So, no, I'm kidding. Um, so, <laughs> so you were so quick oh, to just be like, uh, let's talk about cancer. Uh, obviously you have personal experience with it. And uh, I wanna talk about the bit that you sent us and then we'll kind of dive in to your uh, experience with it. So if you wanna introduce the clip and then we can go from there. This clip is interesting. It cam comes at a weird date because today is the two year anniversary of when I shot my special, which is just very random. I, uh, it's not even really a special, but I did kind of a weird half hour where instead of doing a half hour, I did six, like five minute TV spots. Like what I do for my tight five, but in different outfits and they all had different themes because mm. no one wants to hear me talk for 30 consecutive minutes, I thought. Um, <laughs> and uh, the last one, because I really feel like you can't follow talking about cancer was about my experience having had uh, testicular cancer in 2015 and getting cheated on by my girlfriend and the subsequent sex that I had as a recent cancer survivor with only one testicle now. And then finally meeting my wife um, and I bring her in uh, at the end of the bit to actually say a joke as well. Because, you know, if someone comes to that many shows, I feel like they're entitled to perform as well. <laughs> right. You can do one joke. Uh, she did, had more, but we were like, let's keep it tight. We've she used to do more. No, yeah, that's funny. Uh, so we're gonna start at 24 seconds in. Do you want us to play through that whole thing or stop at the end of the cancer bit? You can do whatever you like. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can stop when I stop talking about cancer. I think it's about three minutes or so. Yeah, I sent I sent Jeremy the timestamp, so. Cool, just abide by that, young Jeremy. And well, let's go. Got the timestamp ending, so. What was the timestamp ending? Three minutes? Uh, it was three and some change. It was 310. I could do that. OK, I believe yeah, it. That's, that's what I looked like 30 pounds ago. Pretty much the same, but yeah, I know. Just God. a handsome young man. I was handsomer. The yeah. healthy weight you put on. The healthy weight. I know. <laughs> I'm playing the clip now. I watched this clip. Yeah, I did survive cancer. Um, don't worry, I am fine. I had to survive cancer. Don't worry about my. It was fine. Uh, my job. They gave me a Kindle. I'm good. Like, <laughs> I asked for an iPod. Whatever. Um, uh, it's okay. It's just like a really great TBT at this point, anyways. Like, 
you bring it up once a year, and people are like, oh yeah, you did survive that. And so, um, I, uh, I, I, you have to tell your parents though, if you're young and you have cancer, which is like pretty serious thing to do. Like I had to tell my mom and my dad, and I told my dad that I had testicular cancer and I might be really sick. He was like, hey, I just want you to know, I'm rooting for you. <laughs> And I said, hey dad, thanks for not rooting for cancer. I'm so glad you're on the home team. Thank you. Um, but the craziest thing did happen uh, while I was like hovering. Uh, I actually got cheated on by the girl on the team. Oh. Yeah. Which sounds like an amazing story to me. Mm -hmm. It has worked zero times. Um, <laughs> But I have met so many understanding dudes. Oh my god. Yo, I've made so many bros. I have not paid for a lot of meetings in three years. <laughs> so good. Um, but, like, after while we were breaking up, she said, Yeah, I don't know, I've only been with 35 guys. <laughs> and it's, it's like the old saying goes, You have to be with 36 before you know. <laughs> and it was over, but like I, I don't know, I was still like <coughs> weirdly sad about it. So I like took an online breakup quiz. <laughs> and the first question was, did she cheat on you while you had cancer? <laughs> then I knew we couldn't <laughs> uh, over. Um, so I like I started dating again, and a lot of my dates ended with, can I get another chance? And uh, <laughs> it's not like. Good, but then I did have like sex on a date, and it was actually at the Upright Citizens Brigade Pier bathroom, and oh my God. <laughs> yeah, we're in the bathroom, and I tried out my new sex catchphrase for the first time. I was like, "Yo, <laughs> did you notice I only had one ball?" <laughs> She said, honestly, I just thought you had two really small balls. <laughs> it's not the woman in Opry Night, okay? <laughs> I, I actually, I met the girl that I'm going to marry. She's here tonight. She's great. I, her name's Anna. I proposed to her. I love that bit because you, the way you share the experience is like, you don't talk about the cancer at all. You just talk about like your experience with the people that are in your life, which is, uh, which is a, a fresh angle on it. I think, you know? Yeah. Um, Thank you. I honestly tried a lot of stuff about the actual experience. And as I'm sure you guys can attest to it, when you get into the specifics of almost anything, people like turn their brain off sort of, because it feels like yeah. school. Like if you got a little too informational, I was like, it's sad and also educational, which is a recipe for disaster in comedy. Right. Even if there's like a killer punchline, which there weren't, but yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, eventually I was just like, all right, my dad, uh, saying that he was rooting for me was just like hitting so much harder than the rest of the material that I was like, all right, that is the bit that I'm going to go with. And then my girlfriend really did cheat on me, which was insane. And these things were just, I feel like much more relatable concepts than right. you know, getting into the, them taking my ball out and having a permanent scar kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> People don't want to hear that. No, you, know, you want could to talk about that. You could lighten the mood a little bit by like, you don't have to say cancer. You could just be like, you know how like there's Lou Gehrig's disease. You could be like, yeah, I had Tom Green's disease. <laughs> Speaking of Tom Green, you look a lot like it. Oh yeah, I get that a lot. You know, what's sad? you know what's crazy though, is people will bring me up on stage like that occasionally. And then I'll, be, I'll have to be like, oh great. Thanks for telling me I look like my least favorite comedian. Uh, so, <laughs> but no, I, yeah. I've never actually seen his stand up, but. He's okay. He's better now. I loved him back in the day, to be right, honest. Right, me too. Yeah. yeah. I was in the eighth years. grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Did you say I was in the eighth grade? <laughs> yeah. So it was like it was uh yes. it was like mm, it was good comedy then. Now it's like okay, this guy's a fucking weirdo, but you know he's still funny. I think he's funny. But oh, Daddy, would you like some sausage? Is something that happens in my head once every three days. <laughs> yeah. He did that. <laughs> So when I worked at Caroline's, he headlined there a couple times, and he, at the end of his uh, set, for like the last 10 minutes, he would do impressions from like Freddie Got Fingered and uh, um, the Tom Green Show. Like he would do callbacks to that. And so it was just no more material. It was just him going, Daddy, would you like some sausage? <laughs> like, Dude, oh man. Celebrity sets are my favorite because that always devolved. Chris Kattan was the greatest defender of it. I don't know if you guys have seen him perform. Uh -huh. <laughs> his entire set and i love chris Catan, but it was <laughs> cool to watch it was what do you do what do you do like uh the, the would you like to buy some cookies like stuff like that yeah yes mango uh, oh yeah mango not touch the mango i think they played um uh what is love by hadaway the, <laughs> the roxbury song and he bopped his oh neck. my god their keepers everything but you know i paid like 60 bucks to see it so would he come out with a loincloth and they toss him like some fruit and he'd be like ah, ah. <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> like that Dude, was funny that bit is unimpeachable it's yeah so funny <laughs> it never got old for me except for that show right. it's like uh <laughs> dance for me monkey yes uh -huh. do your art <laughs> like yeah uh, man, if I ever got to that level, that would, I would not, like, that would, I would kill myself. No, <laughs> no, you'd exploit it for years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't though. Because I'm always, like, I'm always writing new material or, like, taking old material and freshening it up. So, like, I, I can't, I have no patience for being stagnant. Fair. Yeah. Okay, in defense of Chris Kattan here, in defense. Okay, yeah, let's do it. I th This was a tour of SNL alum, and I'm a, massive fan so it was uh Catan went first then Tim Meadows who I think was arguably the best of the three and uh it was closed by John Lovitz so it was nah. like a uh, host feature headliner kind of situation and uh I'm pretty sure Catan and Meadows were just capitalizing and just got into stand-up like brand new yeah which yeah. they were fine for being new they were okay. They were charismatic, but the room was so good. But it was sad to watch Chris Kattan, you know, just, you know, like, dance for me, monkey, kind of thing, like you said. That's yeah. how it felt. Just like, oh, Chris, you're better than this, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. His character you Just write about your life. I would be so much happier to hear about, you know, behind the scenes stories than the rehashing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That when Brooks Whelan uh, headlined at Caroline's, this was back in 2014, he did like for his last 20 minutes, he just talked about sketches that were uh, that were shot down. Like, Michael Che does the same thing. It's so, so yeah. fun. Yeah. yeah, I would and love it, hearing that. Yes, over your characters that yeah. we've, we've already, already seen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I you know that's the thing with comedy. I feel like it sucks because like the minute something's done, it expires. Mm -hmm. Just like a cut bell pepper, it's it's over. Oh, right. Ooh. Yeah. But like, no, it, the expiration date on comedy is so fast. Like, if I know a joke is coming, yeah. I'm just like, uh, I just, we, it's just like a constant overload. If we want new, 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 we're like, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard this before, but like bands, all they want is requests with the old shit. But comedy, if you're not doing new shit all the time, it's like, what are you even doing? Right. Um, yeah. Who was? No, it was somebody at so one of the local clubs it's like a sea level club um they like the the audience like loves to see the same jokes over so they they brought bring in like road you know road dogs that have been doing the same jokes for years and then uh, Ooh, admittedly just, kill yeah destroy rooms harder than i destroy dude, i'm in the back oh. of the room with my jaw on the floor like this dude is uh, saying uh uh what was he saying um glory hole like the christmas carol like blow and people are crying losing yeah. their minds yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. i've been singing that in church since i was 13. Yeah. <laughs> what is this guy doing yeah uh, it's like an emotional connection yeah i mean yeah. and and they lost their shit because they were there last year when he headlined at this club and they love that and they want to hear it again and it's like how hey, do you guys more feel power about to you. In comedy. 
Are you guys pro singing in comedy? I feel like it's a little bit of a cheat, but always works. I, I actually do sing in some bits. Who do I? Same. Like, like, my content. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, but they're it's short. More fun. Yeah. For me, I, it's always like something like a jingle or like an excerpt of like a theme song of a TV show, but with different words, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but the minute you start singing, it feels like the energy in the room just spikes. Yeah. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that glory hole thing, he must be like, oh, God, I get so high off of doing this joke that I can never get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Ugh. He, but for the last, like, 15 minutes of his set, he just pulls out his guitar and does a bunch of Christmas Carol parodies, no matter what, no matter what time of year it is. <laughs> Dude, good for him. Yeah, it works. <laughs> yeah, thing. It Wait, works. Who did that? Paul Bond. Oh, I'm not familiar. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a road dog, man. He gets Bond, it, Paul know. Bond. Yeah. <laughs> Christmas yeah. carols, shake it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, but no, you're right. I mean, you could use that. I mean, it's a it's a strong tool, you know, if it's if it's there to like bump up another joke. For like, sure. I, I don't I don't sing as the punchline, but like I'll do it as a setup or yeah, you know, as a, as a tag to a joke. Dude, absolute. I have a joke where I get the whole crowd singing Hey Jude. Yeah. It's more fun than the rest of stand up. Yeah. Like, I get chills when everyone's singing Hey Jude along with me and I have the microphone. It's like glorified karaoke. It's yeah. so much more fun. <laughs> I you know, did this. I had cancer kind of thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, you, you're doing like a personal set like that. I don't know how you guys feel, um, but I didn't get the same joy out of it because I could feel people tensing. And I'm a born people pleaser, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's going into really personal material, I feel like is a, it feels self-indulgent in a way that stand-up is self-indulgent, but it feels doubly self-indulgent almost. Yeah. It's like, it, it feels like a therapy session as opposed, it feels more for me than for them, I guess. I get it. But, but obviously, you know, you worked it out to the point where the bit works. Sure. Yeah. It's, and I'll be honest, it's an okay bit. It's not the best bit. It's, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, but um, that I, I auditioned at a, a club with this. Um, do you guys know the comic strip? Yeah. On the yes. Side? It's like this mm -hmm. kind of seedy, weird, comedy club that's a vestige of the 80s and i did a less refined version of this that was actually like a month or two after i had been diagnosed and recovered and um the guy his name is richie did you ever audition for him david he no. so you have there's like you wait in march of every year to audition and you're given a date i waited nine months i think it was like late december that i auditioned I go up, I do the cancer material. The last one or two bits do not hit at all. And he like has a little chat with everybody after the set. And yes, yes, yes. I won't do that. But he literally talks like Don an elderly Donald Duck, basically. <laughs> like, <laughs> so weird. And um, we had this conversation and he says, you can't do cancer jokes here. And I was like, can't it's like what if someone in the crowd had cancer and i was it was just a very like weird reasoning because i was like i had cancer like i lived it like it's very strange for you to say that i can't even speak about my own experience but you know these old school clubs which i understand you don't want to offend in any way at all or uh kind of like you can do like as many sex jokes as you want or offend in like kind of a harmless way. But if you talk about something deeply personal, you I've, could walk out from like a middle-aged person who has, everyone's been affected by cancer in some way. Yeah. Literally. I as think it's, doctor. yeah, please. I think it's, I think it's super weird how he's like, Hey, this is an eighties club. Keep it, keep it clean. But he, uh, or I also think it's weird that he's like, Hey, what if someone, you can't tell cancer jokes because what if someone in the audience can relate to you? You know, that would be bad. <laughs> true. <laughs> true. It was very strange. I was just like, like wrapping my mind around it as I left. Like he could have just told me I bombed. Yeah. I sort of did, but he was like attacking cancer as material, which we, as we know, has worked consistently like 
Tig blew up because of it. Like mm -hmm. it propelled her career because she got to that level of vulnerability that was like a threshold that I feel like stand up sometimes keeps us at where it's like, we have to be funny and likable. And if you kind of become your true self on stage, it often doesn't really translate. And when she actually yeah. did it, it was like, oh, it can work. It's kind of like mm -hmm. a precursor for podcasts almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, and also, I mean, she found out like days before she recorded that special too. Yeah, it was so raw. Yeah. So, and, yeah. I mean, it wasn't even fully formed. It was just like, no. I can't not talk about this. And that's almost like the curse of being a comedian is, is you like something happens, you have to talk it out or work it out somehow. Have you guys ever had like a weird? shitty thing happened and you had a set where you went off the rails and didn't address what you were planning on talking about and you were just like <sighs> all right i'm gonna use this as therapy i should have because my ex-girlfriend died in a car accident and then a week later i had to do a showcase of hilarities uh and so that was fun uh but i did really well like somehow i channeled my energy into like i was super high too but uh I think it just killed all my nerves. And I was just like, actually, you know what happens when someone close to you dies is they, is you start to appreciate life more and everything, nothing phases you. I think it was very much a blessing and like a silver lining sort of a way. Um, but yeah, I mean, this was five years ago. It's nothing like sensitive to me right now or anything. So, you know, I'm not looking for pity, but it's, but oh, it was, it was I'm very devastating. This in any way. Right. Insane. Yeah. 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 But I definitely didn't talk about it. I've never talked about it except for when I'm addressing things like seatbelts or something like where it's sort of like kind of I mention it, but I don't go into the actual story. You know what I mean? So, yeah. But. Yeah, that's one of those things where you have to be careful about what facts you give the audience. Like, it's like, right. I, I understand that this is the way it happened, but, right. you yeah. know, you, you got to pick and choose because that's not all going to make them feel good at the end. All right. That's the yeah. goal. Uh, me personally, yeah, I, uh, it took me a while. Um, this is before I even started doing comedy. Uh, we talked about this a few episodes ago. Uh, we did an episode about murder, which is, uh, that's something that happened um, to a close, you know, a close relative of mine. And it was at the funeral where I like just started kind of making light of, of the situation. And it made me feel so good to make other people laugh in such like a dark and, and dismal time. Um, so that's like, that's the moment I realized, oh, I need to make people laugh the rest of my life. And then uh, more recently, I, uh, I had my first anxiety attack and it like, it lingered on until the next day. And then I got on stage that night and I just, I riffed on it. it, it I just wanted to like mention it briefly, but I just, I got a laugh on the first line and I just kept going and getting more laughs because it was so raw and so real in the moment that I was like, holy shit, this is funny. And like that helped me through it. And my very last line was like, now I realize how many people are, are dealing with anxiety. Clap if you've ever had anxiety about anything. And like everybody in the room clap and I just go, everybody's judging you. And, like, <laughs> and I was like, what a great ending to a bit that I literally just came up with. And then, you know, Dude, so that, you it, man. What's that? You tigged it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it it was super raw mm -hmm. and it uh it helped it go away. Like it so and I've in hindsight, like I realized that I work that's how I work through things. Like I yeah. I make sense of it through making myself laugh at it and then I can like talk to other people about it. But until then, I'm just an insensitive asshole. Because I don't know because I don't know how I'm like what I'm feeling yet. Right, right. Yeah. Hey, you sorry. Or actually, never mind. Keep going. I'll tell this story in like after this little bit because it's going oh. off the rails a little bit. Okay. Well, it's <laughs> weird because I have a story that's similar to Jeremy's, except, dude, I thought I had. Okay, so when I was in eighth grade, we all were taught to like check our balls for cancer, right? And I thought I found cancer and I didn't tell anybody about it because I was too afraid to go to the doctor to find out I had cancer I know it's counterintuitive but like it took me years to be like do I have cancer or not do it and like nothing it didn't grow like I went to see a doctor and he's like no you're fine and then like I like was like oh and like I was so happy I like 
like freaked out. It was like years later. So it was like, I was like Jeremy, except I didn't think I was Jewish. I just thought I had testicular cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I, I actually, yeah. I believe shit about myself like that all the time. We tell mm-hmm. lies to ourselves mm-hmm. all the time. And I'm a hypochondriac. Dude, this was the hypochondriac's dream because right. I, I didn't even think that I had cancer, but my boss was like, yeah, you don't take advantage of our free physicals. And I was like, no. So I just went and got a physical and uh, felt like a lump beforehand. I was like, eh, it's probably nothing. And then the guy was like, that's something. And his office was connected to a urologist's office. Mm. And then I was like, seems too <laughs> coincidental to even have happened. And mm. then I waited six hours because, you know, you hear that you have cancer and you think they'll take care of you right away. Yeah. No, there was a line. You know, doctors have schedules. So, like, I'm reading uh, AARP magazine for, like, six hours Damn. waiting to go in. And then uh, I finally go in and... Um, the I tried to do this on stage so many times. This is the funniest part of the whole cancer experience. And it never connected. It was just too involved. But so I'm waiting, you know, like when you get to the doctor and they find you finally get to the chance and you're just sitting there waiting for the doctor to actually see you after the nurse takes you in. And you're just like sort of half dressed. And you're like, this is this room's a little cold. I can't look at my phone because it'll be weird if I'm looking at my phone when the doctor comes back. So you're just kind of like staring, doing nothing for like eight minutes. And it had reached like 15 minutes and I was going like nuts. I was like, I might have cancer. I don't know what the fuck is going on. So like I went to the guy's office, like I left the room and went to his actual office, didn't even knock, just opened the door. And he is licking his bowl of Caesar salad. (laughs) Like he had already finished eating. He was already like, I I was like, this is the best thing. I couldn't wait to write a joke about it, but it was <laughs> impossible to make this happen. There was so much context. And you guys were listening like intently for two minutes right there to even get to that. So it, was, it just never worked. But mm. that was by far the funniest part of the whole experience. I was just like, this is what you were doing, dude? This is insane. You was couldn't he like, wait to lick later? Was he like, we're going to use, we're going to do a cesarean section to remove your, uh, yeah. your, your <laughs> testicle. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I need to finish this cesarean salad first. Yeah. The, the dressing is so good. I don't blame him. It just cracked. I was like, yeah. "This is unfucking believable, man." I what were you going to say? Like, what were you going to do when you got to his office? I was gonna be like, I'm, "I've been waiting." That was just all I was gonna say. Just not <laughs> confrontationally, just be like, "Are you almost ready?" Kind of thing. Yeah. Just like. Maybe, maybe it was an oversight and he forgot for a second that he was supposed to see me. I, I didn't know. It turned out he had a granddaughter that day. He explained later. But mm. just like the weight was insurmountable. Mm, sure. Like, you know, the day you find out you have cancer, you're like, I just want to get this taken care of. I don't want to, you know, dwell. And, you know, I got like an Asian lunch in between. I'm just like sitting there eating noodles, like enjoying the noodles, but like freaking the fuck out. Cause I'm like, am I going to die? I don't These know could be my last die. noodles. Yeah, like I don't know right. the severity of testicular cancer, yeah. but then the guy was just like, uh, you know, licking a salad bowl. <laughs> we all have to have lunch that day. Maybe it's not that serious. Yeah, you need. I think he did that on purpose. He does that to every patient so <laughs> he can relieve them. He's like, I gotta lick the bowl so that they're like, oh fuck, I'm so distracted by how fucking funny this is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a regular Patch Adams. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Man, that's funny. It blew me away when I saw that. I could not believe. It felt so insensitive. Like, I was in shock. I, <laughs> you, you know what would be really funny is if it was like a glass bowl so you can see his tongue going up. <laughs> 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 Who licks a salad bowl? I mean, I guess I, I do know. sometimes, but not at work ever. You yeah. Know? Well, if in the privacy of your own office, yeah. Yeah. You, <laughs> got, you guys lick the I lick plates clean sometimes. I'll get if, if needed, I'll I'll do the finger thing. Yeah, if I gotta get. A, I love. Gotta some. get all that Parmesan cheese out of the uh, with the dressing on the bottom oh, yeah. of the bowl. Gotta get it out. Gotta get it out. Yeah, I paid good money for this. Right, I'm gonna get every last <laughs> drop of it. <laughs> I will make eye contact with another person to lick my plate. Complete tangent. I've never asked anyone this. 
if you have a bowl of cereal, it feels just like a Seinfeld bit, but I promise it's not. I'm just, I'm curious because I have this experience all the time. If you have a little bit of milk left, do you drink it or do you put more cereal in? Mm. Either for me. I put more cereal in every time and I just keep eating cereal. It just never ends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mad scientist approach. Yeah, Sorry, I've been eating part. breakfast for the last two hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So many Reese's Puffs. I had to get a second box. <laughs> Hell yeah. With those, yeah, you definitely have to. <sighs> See, I drink the I, I mean, I haven't had a bowl of cereal in years, but God, if it was Reese's Puffs, I would drink the milk for sure. You, you know what? With uh, Reese's Puffs, um, you know how like Michelle Obama wants kids to eat healthy? I always w wondered if one of her books would be titled Reese's for Breakfast. <laughs> 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 Should be the episode um, of one of her podcasts. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks for laughing at that because nobody ever knows what the fuck I'm talking about when I do it on stage. <laughs> I just uh, am baffled. It was like what we were talking about earlier, David, about how we tell jokes that are a little bit specific and they're so funny, but because of their specificity, people just don't laugh at them and we get all fucking pissed about it. Yeah. We it's just keep funny. doing the joke anyway. Yeah. You have to have a joke that does not need too much knowledge to understand. Yeah, right. and it is infuriating because a lot of times you'll be like, I can't wait to talk about this thing. And you're like, right. oh, I'm boring the shit out of everyone right now. Yeah. yeah, and there are some rooms who are sitting there and they're like, is this a joke about how Michelle Obama is actually a man? Yes. <laughs> yes. Just mentioning Michelle Obama sets off so many different things yeah. in a bunch of people's minds. But yeah, it sucks. Comedy is so weird. It's so fickle. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a strange beat. Sometimes it's so easy and sometimes it's like infuriating. I love right. it, but I, sometimes I hate that I love it. Yeah. It's like, it's like Twitter. I'll write something that I deem genius and I'm like, this will go, this will do a hairline crack all the way through the universe. But no, <laughs> but no, I, I do something real fucking offhand and it just fucking explodes. And I'm like, what the Every fuck? Time, dude. Yeah. Cause that's what you. I feel like the more curated and crafted it is, people f smell it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. The sec I mean, it's just like, you know, when we shoehorn talking about cancer as opposed to just like riffing on it, mm -hmm. it feels so much worse. And that's probably the way it feels with like tweets that you're like, this is genius. Right. Yeah. yeah yep. You take all that time to be meticulous with it and then it's just nothing. We feel too, it. It's too um, contrived. Yeah. You gotta, yeah. gotta get that out of the, the el that element out of comedy and then yeah. it works. Dude, it's the offhanded stuff that everyone actually thinks, too. Right, yeah. yeah. Like, when you have just, like, a thought, you're like, oh, yeah, why not? And then that's what other people are thinking. But, like, the other stuff that you're thinking about, you're like, oh, no one else is actually thinking about this. I'm yeah. trying so hard to craft a bit that no one's mind has ever even come close to coming to this thing. All right. And it's just, like, you're doing gymnastics for no reason. Mm -hmm. and Maybe I should try to be... I should be worrying about being a little bit more relatable and less funny because relatable stuff is still can be very funny, but also relatable is important. So it's like, yeah, you know. I don't know. Relatable is such like a weird avenue to go down to, isn't it? You're just like, ah, what? Is, who are these people? Like, right. I don't know what the fuck they want. Like, it's it's strange. And then eventually you just get comfortable and you're like, I'm just gonna do this eight minutes and never stop. This Christmas Carol thing works. <laughs> yeah. And then you're just like, what am I even, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like it's, it's comedy is very, very odd. Like we all just want offhanded fun thoughts. Like what riffing is here. This is all anybody really wants to see when they go to a comedy club. I think like mm -hmm. they want to hear like a great conversation that maybe only one person is talking as opposed to just like what feels sort of like a lecture with punchlines. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. I remember seeing like Robin Williams hour or whatever. And I was like, this just feels like a lecture. It just felt like I was in school or something, even though he's like the most off the cuff comic. Yeah. I was just like, man, I would much yeah. rather, you know, watch a movie with Robin Williams in it where he's having fun rather than like doing stuff that he thought about for so long. Like, ah, all right. This has gone too far. Yeah. It, I've gone too far. You, I have allowed this to happen. I apologize. <laughs> no, you make a good point, though. I mean, audiences want to feel like they are saying those things for the first time. Yeah. Like, in front of them, you know, they, they, they. 
I mean, even like some audiences or some, you know, some people in the audience actually think that the comic that they saw at the comedy club last night that's been doing that set with tweaks and and rehearsing it at home at for the last year, they think that that's the first time they've ever done it. And just listening to people like talking as they're leaving a show is like, wow, you really think that? And like, that's what people want. I mean, yeah. And then you, as a comic, you're like, I don't even remember the bits because it was just robotic. Yeah. Like, I've done that. And like, you're like, what bit are you talking about? Yeah. Oh, you like the roller coaster thing? Like in your head, it's just the roller coaster thing and all yeah. the content isn't even there. Yeah. It's yeah. so fresh to them. Yeah. It's their first time hearing it. Like, I, I empathize with that though. Like, uh, I feel like as an audience member, it feels like a magic trick then, right? It's kind of mm -hmm. a yeah. beautiful thing mm -hmm. uh, where they think it's like sort of off the cuff as opposed to like, oh man, this is someone's job. I'm watching yeah. someone <laughs> work or their hobby. Like, it's just more fun when they think you're having fun. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You don't want to, you don't want to make people think too much. Like, you know, you want them to be in the moment with you. That's the key. Yes. Yeah. It's a very experiential thing. Yeah. With as, as ashamed as you feel at telling the same joke for the hundred something time. So much. They, shame. they, yeah, it's that shame. You don't want other comics to see you say, saying it again. But then you have, even though they like Joe, like they, you know, it's like you, but it's, you, you got to constantly remember to tell the audience the joke like you're telling it for the first time because it's their first time hearing it, like you said. Mm -hmm. Dude, you can't say a word out of order either. Like I have a bit about Subway. I feel like I said one word out of order once and it got absolutely nothing. And I was like, mm. yeah, that's yep. the bit. That's my good bit for you guys. <laughs> It's funny and how that works. <laughs> now it's nothing. It's 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 literally the worst joke in the world now. Yeah. Or if you do it fine and it just work, it like always works, but just that one time it doesn't work, and you're like, "All right, cool." Um, uh, well, I didn't see that happening. Uh, yeah. And then you don't do it for eight months. <laughs> yeah. You're just like it, it didn't work the one time, just because it's batting nine eighty instead of a thousand. Yeah. Think. Right. Yeah. It's officially <laughs> I only dead. Want jokes that bat. A thousand yeah right there's no yeah. such thing there's there are, a oh there are i feel like some jokes hit everywhere not not necessarily yeah. mine but like i think in any room some jokes will hit anywhere but, but I, I agree with the 980 thing that's i have jokes that are 980 but the that that you know 20 that 020 whatever whatever the it number hurts, is you know? yeah yeah that's the only time you'll remember telling that joke right it's burned in the brain. yeah I always, I, I've got into the habit of like, if a joke bombs, I'm like, good. I can, that means I can fuck with it more. Like there's more room to, for the joke to grow. Um, that's why I record my sets too. Cause sometimes like a joke that I do that always works, doesn't work. And in the moment I'm like, what the fuck? That's funny. And then I'll listen back to it and be like, oh, I paused a little bit different here. Or like you said, oh, that word's out of place. Like it's those little things that you don't notice while you're on stage, but then after you listen to it, it's it's very clear that, oh, I'm, it's my fault. Or like, I didn't make a good, big enough connection with the audience or strong enough connection. And I'll just be honest, guys, it's always the room's fault. Yeah. <laughs> if you could take anything <laughs> away from here. On the room. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yell at them. Literally I... yell at them. Walk off the stage. It's their fault. Yes. <laughs> it's not me. Yeah. I know that. Oh, man. Every other comic killed, they're wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dude, I, I, I was at a, a mic a few weeks ago, and one comic, first time I've ever seen him, uh, just all of his jokes were like, so my wife's a whore, so I was getting blown by this hooker, my wife. And, like, nobody was laughing. And after every, and he would pause for the punchline, or the laugh, and it wouldn't come, and then he'd yell at the audience and then tell the next joke. So by the end of his set, like, people had left the room, it's, it, and I'm just sitting there watching with my hand over my mouth because I can't help but like laugh at him. Is sure, that? I'm mad that that guy took my material. <laughs> <laughs> I cross it off. Cross uh, it off. Man. How many times have I made that joke in my life? Oh, <laughs> I, my <laughs> wife hates it. <laughs> <laughs> it was Jeremy. <laughs> I'll even I'll even drop a name there. Ooh. There you go. Ooh. Oh yeah. Oh come on, he's. <laughs> He's not listening to this. First of all, he'll never listen to this ever. Yeah. Uh, second of all, uh, yeah, that guy is a fucking trip. Uh, yeah. I forgot what he did years ago, but it was weird. Yeah, he's he's 
based out of Mansfield, Ohio, which is halfway between Akron and Columbus. Think so Shawshank. It's like a, yeah, yeah, that's where the where they shot the movie. Right. <laughs> and he's been doing comedy for a while, and yeah, we'll still have like horrible, horrible bomb sets like that. I think he wears he a cowboy has. hat. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> you do reach <laughs> a point where a joke will not hit, but you do start doing comedy, and you're like, okay, I'm never gonna have a horrible bomb set again. Yeah. Even in the worst room, you'll just be competent. In it. it sucks when you still have those. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. an indicator that you should probably stop. Right, right. Or guy who I'll let remain anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> that's really funny people stop. It. Really funny people quit, and then, like, super unfunny people just go forever. Yeah. And uh, then... Dude, trying to get that uh, last laugh, like, before they get off stage. It's like, you're, you've run their light but for three minutes, and you haven't gotten one laugh, and you're eight minutes at. Like, come on. Yeah. Dude, I love the delusion of comedy. It's the best. Yeah, <laughs> it is. This is this is making me all nostalgic. I have not done. Uh, so when you guys are saying you do mics, are you talking about virtual, or are you guys doing like uh, outdoor mics in Ohio? Oh no, no fucks given. Oh, they're indoor mics. Yes. Yeah, we're that we're we're oh. in that part of the country. Um, no, this the weird thing is there's no part of the country it's safe. I know, but the. Uh, <laughs> The thing with the mics is we do have the mask mandate in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we, me, me and Jeremy will stand outside, go in, do five minutes, go back outside. <laughs> and like, there are people eating in there. We are taking a risk. Um, and it's like, it's one of those things where me, I, I am paranoid. So I will stay outside the whole show and just kick it with the smokers and then go in. Cause the air is much cleaner out there with the smokers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I go in. Yeah, do my time and come out. So. Damn. Uh, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Wow. How yeah. are the How are the shows and mics in Ohio? Are they good? Are you guys? They've been packed. Good? Oh. Like, which is not good. But again, <laughs> most like half people are wearing masks. The other half are not. Well, no, not anymore. Not really. Yeah, you have no, to wear a mask to walk around. If you're yeah. at a table, you can take your mask off. Right. Okay. So yeah, there is that risk there. So. Dude, it's. When will this end? I know we don't want to need to talk about COVID, but please, will this just end? Yeah, it's right. all something we're going through, you know? And that's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I mean, shit, when I was sick, and this goes back to your, your bit on uh, relating to the audience, like, I feel like instead of telling the, the, the story about my experience, I was trying to, like, shoehorn things into jokes. Can you even talk about having COVID on stage? Because people would be like, this guy might give it to me. Like, obviously. Yeah, you know, I, yeah. I just any more. But I mean, the whole thing is about contagion. Yeah, so, well, the yeah. first time, uh, one of the first, like the first weekend I did it, I did it at a club um, I was featuring. And the first two shows that I did, um, I could hear the tables up front, like whispering. And then like, I saw them like putting their masks on. And I'm like, oh, and I don't, still have it like i have a i have a joke earlier in my set where uh with punchlines is that's a dick move um and so you know i called that back i was like that would be the dick move like for me to actually be here and still be sick like i'm better now but yeah mm -hmm. yeah i'm not a <laughs> i'm not a piece of shit sure um but yeah no Months i was like ago. shoehorning it into my set rather than actually like really being in the moment. That should be the name of your special. Honestly. Shoehorning? Did you lose yeah. me? Am I gone? Yeah. David's brother shoe. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> did you did I did I freeze? Yes. We were just making puns about your name though. Oh, your your you. special should be like shoehorning. Or, <laughs> or like, you know, whatever. Just like, you know, you yeah. get what I'm saying. Is that is that where you lost me when I was shoehorning? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. That's the word. That is the word of the day for this episode. Shoehorn. Um, no, I was just like instead of being like authentic about my, about my experience, I was worried about like writing jokes about it instead of just letting the punchlines naturally happen. And I learned that. Mm -hmm. Like, and I feel like, but what you were saying about the the cancer bit, um, probably felt the same until you did the dad bit. I mean, yeah. The is first that, is that true? I remember the first time I found out and I just did a mic. Mm -hmm. I went to the mic and I didn't want to even talk about it. 
It was, I mean, my TIG set was not even a show. It was a mic. <laughs> um, and uh, the mic was too full, so I had to leave. And I didn't want to tell anybody. And uh, I went all the way across town with another comic. Didn't even want to mention it just because I was like, I don't want to talk about it. And I don't really know enough about it yet. And I feel like just talking about cancer because of comics like TIG <clears throat> feels hack already. Like it just felt wrong. And then I did a set and nothing about it worked. And it, like the host hugged me. It was just like, uh. <laughs> I was just like, this is not what I wanted. Like it made me feel even worse. Mm. I was like, oh, it's real now. Like people feel bad for me. And I, don't, I, I thought I might die. Like I didn't know. And um, then uh, I don't know if you guys know, it was not that serious at all. You just have a surgery that takes an hour and then they remove a testicle and then you just can't really walk for like a week and that's it. Um, yeah. But after that, like I, my rep for a little bit was the guy that had cancer. So that was kind of a bummer too, you know, like, cause I was like, oh, now I have a thing, but it's a kind of thing I don't want to be my thing. Like I don't know you guys, I think people still are like, you're the one ball guy, like in, in Rose in New York, everyone goes to it immediately. Like I've yeah. done, I want to say 35 roasts and I think 35 for 35 people have done ball jokes. Like it's the only thing people know about me really. And yeah. I don't know if you guys have a thing like that, but it is kind of boring after a while. So I sort of don't really do, or I stop doing cancer material because it's just like, ugh bums crowds out and also comics immediately uh shoehorn you yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's, it's a weird thing you're like oh cool i can kind of maybe play with this and you're like i'm good it just it feels too personal and exploitative of my real life to even continue with it mm. we had a comic in cleveland i think I can't remember if it was a comic or just someone I knew, but I'm pretty sure there was a comic that had testicular cancer and had like a whole bit about it and everything. I just can't remember what it was. I don't think say, Jeremy remembers. Did he say like balls in your court or something like that? <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, no, I don't. Did you say that? Um, oh, yeah. No, oh, I heard I mean? many like Matt's got one more ball than he has jokes. Like that was a classic roast joke. Yeah. I heard. Uh, Matt's so cheap, he got rid of a ball or something like that. Just those over and over and over. And I was like, all right, hmm. I'm good. But uh, nope. from 2015 to 2016, I ran that shit hard. I was like, <laughs> this will elevate my comedy status. <laughs> you get to like exploit your own tragedies. And it wasn't even really that tragic to be completely right. honest. But, my girlfriend did cheat on me at that time, which was very weird. Mm. I, I feel yeah. like that's the bigger. I mean, at this point, you know, it, it was so long ago that that it's probably not even like fresh to you and no, irrelevant. I'm completely over. But at the time, it was so weird to find out. <laughs> it yeah, was, it, it was you strange. go through. Yeah. That, that's what I like about the joke is like you start with this is what my work did for me like I got a Kindle. She like, kept the Kindle. She kept the Kindle. How did she I get the Kindle? the Kindle? She asked if she could borrow it, and then we broke up, and she had the Kindle. Uh, talk anymore? You try to rekindle that relationship? Hey, yeah. I did tweet. Um, an ex of mine took my Kindle, and I'm debating if I should get it back. And then I blocked her because I was like, oh man, if she sees this, it could be really bad. Mm. But uh, mm. I would love to get that Kindle back because I buy so many books. Right, yeah. I see them in the background. That's the waste. Ugh. <laughs> I would love that Kindle. But yeah, she, uh, it was the weirdest thing. I think I found out about it because she didn't want to come to my work party, which was weird because we were both very into free food. And <laughs> yeah that was the the signal that something was off and i found out what was going on did she there. like how did how does that come up was it while you still had cancer that she did no it? so i 
had had it and then she came with me to for the surgery came back and was just like and we'd already like sort of broken up it was all probably all my fault yeah. and then um go back and listen to the recording <laughs> yeah and then when i came back just one day she started crying it was like i cheated on you we just need to break up and that was it and i played the victim card for a long time but i was probably not that great myself in retrospect or something i don't even know but playing the victim card is probably not cool after a while <laughs> yeah you can only right. play with that for so yeah. long you can, you can be yeah. the victim in your head forever it's yeah. probably <laughs> so i did that for two years <laughs> yeah well at least i mean two years that's that's better than the president he's been doing it for four um Dude, yeah. so true. All he does is play the victim card. That's not even political. That's just a fact. I know. <laughs> yeah. No, he's he's the victim of everything. Dude, it's so funny to watch. I'm just like, <laughs> I read oh, I read a lot of books on leadership. I speak on leadership. Like the very first thing that you learn in all of them is take 100% responsibility for everything that happens to you, even if it's not your fault. It's your responsibility now. Dude, and, and I it's dude, like, it took me forever to realize that. It's so he didn't even read chapter one. <laughs> and he's the leader of the free world. But that's not in his book, da David. Jeez. You're right. You're right. He only yeah. reads his own books. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even do that. He doesn't even. Right. Doesn't, yeah, he no. ghost, uh, someone ghost wrote it for him. There's no yes. right. A hundred percent. The author has already like spoke out against him. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's off the rail. But yeah. How did, like, 35 guys? What? Oh, yeah. She had been with many dudes. That was based in fact, for sure. So she cheated on you with 35 different people? Or, no, no. Uh, she had been uh, with 35 guys before. Okay. And I don't think... Honestly, this this is not the best version of this set. It's just, like, the only one that's online. Yeah. But um, <laughs> she... Uh, yeah, I think the exact wording was when she said, I haven't been with that many guys. Just, like... 35 or something like that and she just wanted to go be with more people and you know that's fine you know what i didn't it, at the time i was really like it's her fault it's her fault but yeah. dude we're just people man right yeah fine people have moments of selfishness and you can't let it dwell on it forever right it's like hey girl you do them yes <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is full on therapy, David. This is the best <laughs> podcast of all time. This is comedy, man. <laughs> Comic <laughs> therapy. Yes. That's what we need is we need therapists who are also comedians who can like make you find the funny in everything. All right, this, this is, is crazy, happening. but I actually do comedy. I act as a comedy therapist for people. Yeah. No joke, yes. Where I just talk to people about their career as like a manager type. It's more like I'm their manager, but from the perspective of a fellow comic and uh it just goes forever just talking about like what they want to accomplish and whatnot and it feels really really good yeah um but yeah comedy therapy sort of does exist because i think maria bamford does it as well with uh people too yeah yeah she does pretty much everything better than all of us it's good to talk goals and talk comp, like shop with people because you kind of process a lot of things that you may not have understood before. Uh, I did that with Dan a couple of nights ago. We were just trying to sort through like what we want to do next. And it's just like very cathartic. And so, yeah. It's weird because you feel strangely um, self-indulgent once again, like talking about yourself. Yeah. You're just like, oh man, it's boring if I tell people that I want to do a special in two years. Like, yeah. but right. I feel like other comics are the people that would actually want to hear it if they're good enough friends with you. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I like, yeah, I, I do love that conversation um, because most of the time it's like, you should do it. Yeah. Like, here's, you know, but also not like blindly. Like you also need to write better jokes. Like I like when people just give me the God's honest truth. Like I'm not, my feelings are not hurt easily. <laughs> good. If That's you have a per, if you have a perspective of me, it's not my perspective of me, and it, I value that. <laughs> right on. Well, that's healthy. Yeah. 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 I, I get mad at first, but then, like in my head, but then I think about it. I'm like, oh no, they have a they have a point. Dude, that is the way to live. They have a point is the best motto of all time. Yeah. Even if it's not true, 
it is yes. to them. <laughs> it's a different way of looking at it. Like that's, and that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast. It's like, let's take this topic that one person has a different angle on that I don't, that, and they made it funny. And let's talk about how other people made it funny. And like, there's no object, one objective truth. So why, you know, why try to yes. consider something as being like good or bad? It just is. Right. I and like that. Yeah. And there are so many ways to talk about it. Like there are an infinite number of ways to talk about anything if you have that perspective. And that's why I wish more people were like, instead of being like, no, it's either this or this. Like, no, it's everything, but yeah. it's also nothing. <laughs> Bro, we should all just smoke Bro. weed right now. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Smell um, vision. <laughs> but, the, but here's the thing, that, that's kind of what you do with this joke. Like, and I think that's how you connected it with audiences is because like you started talking about, you know, how, what, what work did uh, for you with your, how your parents responded, how your girlfriend responded, how the new girl that you hooked up with responded. Right. Everybody can relate to that. Not everybody can relate to having cancer. So, sure. I guess the stuff that was about my experience wasn't as relatable. You kind of externalized it. Like the stuff where I was talking about me, people were like, eh, not really. But they were like, oh, okay. Uh, women not wanting to hook up with you, relatable. But guys really like, holy shit, are you okay, dude? Can I buy you something? Yeah. That really did happen. And when I did that show for the first time, oh, it exploded. I was like, oh, okay. I did find out the angle. It is, cancer is more about the centering of others than other things. Just like, you know, as we white people, we white center. I did it to Jeremy before the show started. Yeah. Uh, about my mom working at a Native American health clinic. Like, when people hear other people have cancer, they immediately don't ask about it. They tell you about how they knew someone with cancer. Mm -hmm. And you got to the heart of what I did with it, man. Good. That's, I knew we would find it. <laughs> yeah. No, that's it. That's totally what I did. Yes, because it's people's reactions to cancer are funnier than cancer itself. Right. They're not, they're not necessarily laughing at your thought. They're laughing at their own like experience attached to what you said the discomfort at addressing something so raw right to someone's face it's very weird you know like not to bring it back but like when steven was talking about his girlfriend that's we don't know what to say it's really hard and that's you talking about it is tough but you talking about me not knowing what to say is like is easier to talk about and right. relatable for everyone because that's like so incredibly intense but for mm -hmm. me like as an outsider i'm just like you can't say yeah. the wrong thing right no you got to reassure people You're like no it's fine everything's cool like yeah uh, so like, now you have a job yeah it's like the weird it's very weird to bring up any kind of tragedy um mm -hmm. because immediately then you have to reassure and play therapist to the other person because mm -hmm. now they're the victim almost it is it is very weird. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, my grandma died. What? Oh my god! No, seriously. Like, and then I'm like, guys, I'm fine, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. She's the one that died. She's yes, not. <laughs> exactly. yeah. It's like you're like a second degree. You're two degrees away from that yeah. tragedy, kind of thing. It's it is it's interesting how uh, you know human nature is to constantly reassure others, but right. it is. It's part of the experience. Yeah, make everybody feel comfortable. All the time. Steve, we talked about this in the murder episode too, because like I was telling my story and how at first when I started joking about it, like audiences would just be like, "Aw," or like, or like tighten up. And our guest on that episode, AJ, was like, "They don't have permission to tell you how to feel." Like, I forget how he worded it, but it was basically they're seeing it through their own personal lens like they you haven't made it okay for them yet like you have yeah. to it, it, there's like an extra step that you have to take to connect that the self-deprecation i know i watch audiences tense up at self-deprecation a lot even though it's clearly made to make them laugh they just don't want to laugh to um to acknowledge something to be perceived as true when it can be a negative seen as negative in society so yeah. it's like weird that's a really good point mm -hmm. yeah yeah if you, you see it a lot too far with self-deprecation people are just like oh you think of yourself like that mm. right it's so sad yeah they're just like oh there's no one that's really that well adjusted but they're just like oh my god these people are just 
sad people talking. It's not right. it's not what I thought the comedy show would be. Yeah. yeah. I thought this was going to be fun, but now everyone's <laughs> pressing the shit out of me. Yeah, you have to make it okay like that at the end, yes. you know. You, that's that's it. You they can't leave feeling sad or angry. You right. Know, you have to find a way to neatly tie it up into a bow. That's kind of what makes that TIG set so incredibly incredible. Because it's, let's li do you want to listen to it? We should listen to it. Dude, I've listened to it many times. I'm happy to, but I uh a friend of mine uh, or a friend of my brother's really. He was like his best friend and we were just like sort of friends. He was diagnosed and died from cancer, but I gave him the TIG set and then I felt so weird about it afterwards. I never brought it up with him, but mm. it was such a strange, almost centering move of my part to give him a piece of media to consume about his own mortality now. And I regret that so much, but this was like right when it came out. When was that like 2013 or something? Mm. I don't know. Maybe he never listened to it. I hope he never listened to it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> your your head and your heart were in the right place. Yeah, I think <laughs> I was like, I just want to relate to him. And which is, you know, the weird, like, making it about myself mm -hmm. kind of thing. And this take thing is so, I imagine it probably only made him sadder rather than like, oh, I can relate to that. Right. Oh, like, oh God. Jeremy, do you want to pull up the, the first TIG uh, and bit? How? <laughs> what? <laughs> what did you say? Said, and how? <laughs> she starts with what? Hello, I have cancer. I feel yeah. like so many, so many comics have adopted this exact cadence in New York, at least. The mm. hello, my God. It, it's almost painful to hear it now, but um, when I first heard it, I was like, oh, this, is, this is groundbreaking comedy, I think. Mm -hmm. Good evening, hello. I have cancer, how are you? Hi, how are you? Is everybody having a good time? I have cancer, how are you? Ah, uh, it's a good time. Diagnosed with cancer. <sighs> Feels good. Just diagnosed with cancer. <sighs> God. <sighs> oh my God. It's weird because with humor, the equation is tragedy plus time equals comedy. <laughs> I I'm just at tragedy <laughs> right now. That's just where I am in the equation. Oh, it's fine. I, uh, I'll, I'll, here's what happened. I went, I'm going to get, it's very personal. Found a lump. Guys, relax, everything's fine. I have cancer. <laughs> Found a lump. Got a mammogram. You know, they're doing the ultrasound. They're like, oh, we found a lump. I was like, oh no, that's my boob. <laughs> they're like, no, 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 we we found a lump on the other side too. I was like, yeah, I got one over there too. Those are my boobs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I ended up getting biopsies, uh, which is painful. It was like being stabbed. I felt like I'd been rear-ended all day and then just dropped off back at my house. I couldn't move or anything. Um, and it was just, it was so like, intrusive and horrible. And I was just like, God, after all of these, like, ice pick stabbing feelings, I better have cancer. Somebody over here just keeps going, oh. <laughs> oh, I think she might really have cancer. <laughs> Who is this really bad? 
<laughs> oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's gonna be okay. It might not be okay, but I'm just saying. It's okay. You're gonna be okay. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with me. Damn. She gets to, she does, it is very uncomfortable though when she's talking about her experience. You totally nailed the, people can't really relate to it and it's, they go to that place where it's like, can we laugh at that? Right. Like, it's a bit, but fuck. This is, so, oh, David's on mute. It's like they know it's funny. Like the comedians are like, this is gold, but, and I want to tell these people, but I'm putting them in a weird place where they may not laugh at it, despite the fact that it's clearly nice, ironic humor. Yeah. You know? Like the thing about her boobs is great. Right. But it's just like, whoa, this is a lot to put on us because we just spent $20. It's a Wednesday. We have work tomorrow. Our lives. We're not expecting anything other than just like crowd work and bits about, you know, uh, politics. Like they weren't expecting to be blindsided by a revelation. And mm -hmm. when she breaks that tension so hard by just pointing at the guy that sighs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, dude, that's the connector. That is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause even though he's audibly sighing, everybody's internally like, what? Like what? Yeah. This, ooh, this is heavy. And anytime something heavy comes up, it's just yeah. like, I, I just do this. Yeah. You know? I just start shaking my head because I yeah. can't actually say anything of value. Yeah. What do you, how do you think she like really, I mean, what's the point where there's that release of tension? Is it when she, she says, I, I'm going to be fine. Well, I don't know. I think, yeah. boom. Yeah. That's yeah. when that picks up, man. That's when it's good. I feel like this is so much better than the next one because. Mm -hmm. The blindsiding of this one is so good. Right. It's like. You can't top that, really. Yeah, I don't know if I'd seen anything like it before. Like, I feel like she created a new vocabulary for comedy. Like, we were talking about uh, tigging earlier. Like, this is a type of set where someone goes in after something really personal has happened, and Pete Holmes does it in the pilot of Crashing, and it's kind of like, you know, appropriating what she did. But mm -hmm. we all are tigging basically when we do, like I lost my job, I tigged, I had a good set, but I left and I was like, well, that's what tig did. It's nothing like, I didn't break ground. Like she, I think she broke legitimate ground here. Yeah. 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 It's like you, nothing I've ever, some of the best comedy I've ever seen really. Mm -hmm. Like Andy Kaufman sort of did it, but without punchlines when he had cancer. And he had like the lump and he'd have people come up and touch the lump. <laughs> he, I mean, it was, it was funny, but like to comics, but to the audiences, it didn't cross over because it was just like, it stayed in the uncomfortable zone, mm -hmm. which is Andy Kaufman just stays there as opposed to Tig, who's like, I'm going to break through that and actually get with you. Yeah. It's weird yeah. how you, you can't almost top it, but you can't put it anywhere but the beginning. And it just happens, so you have to like, what are you gonna do, just not talk about it? Especially when you wrote these really funny jokes for it, like. Mm -hmm. Dude, well, have you guys have listened to this whole set, right? I okay, can't say I'll that I have. It. Do no. you mind if I spoil a little bit? No, go ahead, it's fine. Um, at the end of this set, she does one prepared joke that has such low stakes that it is 50 times funnier in retrospect. It's just about like a B being in traffic and like existing and not really knowing that traffic exists or something along those lines. Mm. It's just like, you know, a very silly, you know, Tig did kind of like heady mundane stuff. And it's with knowing how, what's going on in her life and that that's what she was going to do. It's like one of the most cathartic laughs ever. Like it's mm -hmm. it's very very funny and it's just like oh yeah that that is what we would have seen and it would have been fine but knowing that that's actually going on what's actually going on in her life it's hysterical like that she was gonna <laughs> do bits about bumblebees in traffic <laughs> like 
you know, the silliest little thing. Yeah, the, I mean, yeah. what it, uh, the first, what, seven tracks on this album are about, are, are from the, are based off of the cancer thing, like. And her mom is six. She had some relationship thing happen as well. Mm -hmm. It's just like a laundry list of horrible events happening all at once for her. Mm -hmm. And it just gets worse and worse and worse, which is, it's funny. But then, boom, that tension when she just does her actual bit at the end. Uh, and you just hear the language of the patter of a prepared bit. Uh, it's one of the best comedy moments I've ever had. <laughs> I heard it on a CD. I don't think this was even filmed, if I recall. I think Louis released it, actually, if I recall. Yeah? Yeah. It was like, I paid like five bucks on louisck.net in 2012 or 2013 for this thing. Okay. I didn't realize that other people released albums through his website. I think this was maybe just the one, or maybe there was one other, but like, he was as we recall, so big back then mm -hmm. that like him just like, you know, saying Louis CK presents was such a platform to help other people out. Yeah. And, I mean, Bill Burr does that now. Yeah. And now Tig has denounced Louis, but yeah, sure. Uh, at the time I was like, Oh yeah, I'll give it a shot. I've seen Tig on premium blend. In the <laughs> right. I'm a fan. But then I was just like, oh my God, this is nuts. This is yeah. like, it was next level. No, it is. And it's that you have to make that connection, especially with something so real and raw and in the moment. Like if you can't make that connection, you might as well just be talking to yourself. Like, Right. Yeah, dude, a hundred percent. If you're literally just talking about, uh, you know, not having boobs, it's going to be very, very sad. Right you have to figure out how to get everybody on the same page or else it's going to be the most uncomfortable half hour for people ever. Sure. And I think this is just a good lesson for like all comedy, all film, all forms of entertainment. It's just like, if you navel gaze a little too hard, people zone out immediately. Like the second, Navel gaze. I've never heard that. Oh, you've never heard? Well, there's, there's also shoegaze, the genre of music. But right. navel gazing is when you're just like talking about yourself and just going on mm -hmm. and on and on. And then, which is a lot of comedy. Like that guy who you were talking about, who was talking about his wife and being with prostitutes. Like, yeah, I'm sure there's a fun, there's definitely a funny way to address that. Anything can be funny, but like if you just talk about it in a self indulgent way, so now you um, gotta acknowledge that there's a crowd. Okay, yeah. No, I've <laughs> I've felt that on stage before. And I, I mean we see it happen all the time. Even even the best of us will will get fall into that trap. At least oh, for a little bit. For sure. It's it's a, a dangerous hole to go down. I feel myself doing it all the time. I feel people getting bored as I talk a lot. Well, you know what's funny? Uh I mean, I feel like this is in like Dale Carnegie or whatever, but uh it's, people who ask questions and listen like after you leave that interaction with them you're like oh wow they were great even though they didn't even they never even really said anything they just listened to you talk about yourself Dude, we love to talk about ourselves the ultimate secret mm -hmm. Dale Carnegie's how to win friends and influence people book is like cheating at life mm -hmm. it's insane how it's just like all these little hacks to make people like you yeah it's almost sociopathic, to be honest. I'm almost. sitting here writing down the name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a really, it's a really good book. You're just like, oh, people just like if I ask questions. It's kind of like the scene in Forty Year Old Virgin where Steve Carell just asks questions and then yeah. Elizabeth Banks goes out with him. It's like, yeah, that's all it takes, man. It's yeah. If anybody asks me quite like I and I've read the book. So after a couple of minutes of me talking about myself, I'm like, wait, 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 this isn't how this is supposed to go. Right. No, I know. That's why it's great being on a podcast because you guys just ask me questions that I love. Mm -hmm. Dave, we're not friends anymore because we're friends on false pretenses and you've manipulated me. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> the only reason people like me is because I'm I'm mentally doing this, this checklist. I was like, all right, chapter eight says, yeah, no. No, dude, that book, <laughs> that book does mess with you for like six months and then you kind of wean off of it. Yeah, no, I, it's not fresh in my mind anymore, but I mean, it's it's a useful book for sure. It's a great dating technique too. Like, yeah. I used to call, I told my wife that I would just Johnny Carson on dates. I would just ask questions. Mm-hmm. and for hours and the dates would go very well mm-hmm. if you just treat it like uh, an interview where you're and i was genuinely interested it can't go wrong yeah but it can't, you know you do have conversations with the other person just doesn't have much to say and it's like it feels like pulling teeth right yeah like i've literally asked you every single question you have nothing for me but yes or no answers that wasn't even a yes or no question and you're not interested in anything that I have to bring either. So it's, it's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've definitely yeah. experienced quite a few of those. <laughs> oh, for sure. For well, sure. It's like, uh, you know, telling someone they have a great set after a mic and then you are realizing, like, oh, this is going nowhere. Yeah. Like, uh, you don't know what to say after it. They don't want to answer any questions. They don't want to talk to you. They don't give a shit. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah. What did you think of, you know, <laughs> Because like when somebody says I have a great set, it's like I want to dive into that more. It's like yeah. all right, because I just got off stage. Like I want to know. I want to get you. I'm feedback. funny. How like a clown? Yeah. Like yeah. Say, you? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how I'm funny. <laughs> you know, I think that's why like big comedians don't like like the compliments. They're just like, oh, thank you, because they've gotten all the validation they need. Yeah. There's right. they've maxed out on validation. They're like, all right, I'm good. Thank you very much. Uh, I've heard it before. I know I'm very good. Thank yeah. you. And they just move along. They don't. They don't want to talk because they they've gotten everything they need out of comedy, and now it's just a job. <laughs> yeah, I right. want to talk shop about my set. Yeah, <laughs> you need more. You need more validation. That's good. Yeah, you still give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. That's funny. Uh, is there anything else you want to add as far as uh, your bit, or as far as cancer? Well, or- you sent me a few links and I watched them, even though I'd yeah. seen them before. Um, Gaffigan, who is very much in the news right now. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> you're, I mean, the timing of, I said this before, this episode is insane because you sent me Gaffigan clips. And also, as we were mentioning before, Chadwick Boseman passed yesterday, which is like shocking. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's another thing about cancer is that sometimes you have no idea whatsoever that someone is sick. And they don't show, like they don't bald. They just look like beacons of health. They're still just perfect. And it just happens. It's almost like, I was thinking the other day, like you never know when a battery is dead. It just Mm. like happens. It's kind of like that. Yeah. Um, But uh, the timing was very, very weird. And the Chadwick Boseman thing is incredibly sad. But Mm, the Gaffigan bits that you sent me were really interesting because the first one is like more him saying i want to see if i can make cancer funny sort of like an anthony cheselneck might Mm -hmm. but with you know the gaffigan flair and the second one he has a bit more perspective because his wife had a brain tumor Mm -hmm. but it's not about her experience once again as we've figured out from this whole thing Mm -hmm. it's about his experience reacting to it like now i can't win a fight and his pet yeah. at it. Like, it's a fun set, but it's also the tiniest bit insensitive, too. Like, I don't know. Have you guys seen um, the Eugene Merman documentary? No, not yet. Yeah. No, no, but I love you watch the doc. It's like the shortest documentary ever. It's like 70 minutes. Um, <laughs> it's about as fast. It started as a joke, and uh, is the name of the doc. And the end of it, is like the last 20 minutes after like the history of the Eugene Merman Festival is all about how his wife had cancer and unfortunately passed away at the beginning or right before the pandemic and is raising his child. But it's so incredibly weird to watch because it's all documenting him doing jokes about it while she is suffering at home. Like he's not with her during the last few months of her life and like the talk at the end, like him and her kind of earnestly about how it'll be a document for their child. And that kid is gotta be like, dad, why the fuck were you doing jokes about mom's cancer 
while she was dying, instead of just being at home, you are already a successful comedian. You can make voiceover money already. You're fine. It just, that is, I guess, the thing that bugs me about that the most visceral reaction I've ever had to any cancer material, even more so than Tiggs, was that because it was just like her at home and him like trying it out and like failing. And I was like, just do this after she passes away. Like there's an expiration date on her. And like, it was painful to watch. And it made me think of Eugene Merman a little differently. It was like, it's not important. Comedy is great, but it, if you have a family member that's dying and your way to cope with it is to do jokes, it's probably not the best. It's definitely a selfish uh, uh, coping. Oh my like, God. I was, I mean, I was at work watching it, like sort of half watching it, but I was just like so frustrated. I was like, what are you doing? Why are you at like a bad bar show right now, popping in to do eight really sad minutes on your wife dying instead of, you know, just like making the end of her life as enjoyable as it could be. Mm -hmm. Like there could have been a whole documentary about why he was avoiding it. Like it was fascinating to me. If you guys can get Eugene Merman on this podcast, please confront him. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like he would do it. <laughs> I'll have my people talk to his people. Out for this thing. It was, it just like blew me away. I'm like, Ugh! I've never had such a visual reaction. I mean, we all cope in our own ways, but it, to a certain extent, like you, I mean, not to a certain extent, like you have to take, put other people as a priority, it, it, you know? For sure. Like, it just felt like a tacked on thing to the documentary too. Yeah. But by the end, I completely forgot what the doc was about his festival because it was yeah. like such a bizarre, selfish thing that I'm literally like basing a whole screenplay off this moment. Mm. Like, it, it was just like, blew me the fuck away. It was insane. Um, I was going to say one one other cancer thing that I was really affected by. Did you guys see Funny People? I'm sure. Yeah, I am. Oh, my God. The worst cancer movie. Right. Such a fun movie. And then anytime it's about cancer, it, it becomes like the preachiest thing in the world. It's, mm -hmm. it's, very, it's very hard to do cancer, right? There's 50-50. Like, yeah. You know what? Like as soon as you get cancer, you just start watching all the movies again. <laughs> yeah, it's automatically super dramatic, even though the tone isn't really there. But just the fact that it's about cancer really brings it down to that. It's like cheating. There doesn't have to be any special effects. You're just like you say the word cancer. It is a special effect. Right. Like I have can't. Whoa! This is a deep movie. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you don't even have to look. He doesn't even have to look sick. It's a. Uh, I feel like COVID's the next one. The I have COVID movie. All right. It's the, the new genre. Right. Yeah. I have COVID. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you should definitely do a, a TIG set parody. Yeah, for me, it's it's not fresh anymore. Like I did it the other night at an open mic, and I didn't, I didn't feel invigorated by it. You know. Yeah, but you gotta have that that feeling, or else it once the feeling's gone, it feels like you're reading out of a book. Yeah, at this point, what's more funny to me it was my hospital experience. Just like, I'm not, I don't care as much about being sick anymore. I care more about the fact that they charged me so much money for so like little. <laughs> and they said they wouldn't. I was literally just reading about that. That yeah. thing is so fucked. How much did they charge you? $3,448. Oh. Damn. Yeah. And how long, cool. how long were you in the hospital for? Uh, two hours. What? <laughs> I was going to guess like three days. No, no, I didn't even say overnight. Like, that's how, that's, yeah, that's how my vital, like, my heart was good. My lungs were good. Like, my liver enzymes are a little high, but Dude, that's it. Michael Moore is way ahead of us. He's made the documentaries. We haven't yeah. anything about it. Three thousand four hundred forty-eight dollars. Like That's so such a waste. Yeah, the the one of the first weeks comedy was back in Ohio. I brought my hospital bill up on stage and I was like, this is like and I went through each charge and like what they would have to do for me to feel okay paying each thing. And it was it wasn't like funny, but it was cathartic for me. It was like, really? Like two hundred dollars for an x-ray? I didn't even get to see it, let alone keep it. 
you know? <laughs> like, I need some wall art. You I know? need a souvenir, yeah. Yeah. Why Should have forwarded that? that to the White House. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, so. Like, here, yeah. take care of this, bitch. I think my favorite uh, joke that came out of that is a hospital is a restaurant where everything on the menu is market price. <laughs> you don't <laughs> like it, yeah. <laughs> There is no discount. I want yeah. the grouper. How, what's the market price on the grouper? We'll send you a bill for it in two months. <laughs> I've got a Groupon for this MRI. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Dude, if they're gonna if they're gonna be if they're gonna go all in on this capitalistic, like for profit <laughs> healthcare, they better offer like Labor Day deals. You yeah. know? <laughs> two for one COVID testing. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 so stupid. Yeah, um, we're running out of time. Otherwise, I'd say let's listen to the Gaffigan bits. But um, yeah, uh, yeah I, that was just another thing where he exploited his wife's tragedy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we got to cut this down to two hours. So yeah, <laughs> uh, okay. no, I'll, I'll be doing a lot of editing. That's for sure. <laughs> this was good though. This is no, fun. it was good. Yeah, I, I feel like this was very. This is the longest podcast I've ever done. I think. Yeah. But, we, yeah, unless we have something we have to do, we don't we don't end it unless it, like the conversation just kind of trails off. Right. I mean, we learned about Dale Carnegie today, guys. So. Yeah, dude, we went all over mm -hmm. the place with this. Uh, yeah. So, anything else you want to anything you want to plug, Matt? Um, yeah, I make mashups now. To be honest, since the quarantine started, I don't really uh, do as much comedy, but uh, I go by DJ Fleetwood Mash, and you can find me on Vimeo. <laughs> drop some links if you want oh, my okay. mashups are pretty sick to be honest <laughs> send me send me a uh send me a, a track and then we'll close the it's the show really long i make 30 minute mashups take a wow. clip send me a clip that you really like that, uh, we'll, that we'll end the episode on oh seriously okay honestly i'm so excited right now yeah, take, <laughs> well, yeah i yeah, like take my mashups way more than i've liked anything i've ever done <laughs> Not Play yet. a half hour mashup and then that'll be like ten percent of the podcast. <laughs> oh yeah, maybe I'll just <laughs> Okay. Uh, <laughs> the last two minutes of that is my shit. Hi, I'm Sarah. Uh -huh. But uh thank you guys for having me on. I'm honored. Absolutely. Really cool. Yeah. It was fun. Thanks for joining us, man. Yeah. Um yeah, we had uh, Jean Marco a uh, few week uh, last week's episode that we dropped. Uh we've had Freddie G on here. Freddie G. Yeah. New York uh, Jews and half Jews. I like it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole market that we're missing here in Cleveland. <laughs> um, do you, it, uh, just off the top of your head, do you, uh, any comics that you know out there that are like Talking Shop um, that would be somebody that you that, could reach uh, out to? Uh, dude, so many. Do you want me to just, I can just plug this podcast in uh you know how i write those gigantic news yeah i love those. probably like eight i actually know a guy who works who works in a covid hospital okay. uh, at the beginning his name is mike wow. um yeah i'll send you his facebook and you can just say matt levy recommended that i reach out is he a comic yeah he's like the perfect guy to talk to because he he was a nurse he still is a nurse but he was there in the thick of it wow yeah. Does, does he have uh, any bits about being on the front lines? He doesn't. He, it's weird. He doesn't really love talking about it oh. um, as much on stage. But okay. it's like being on the battlefield. It's like I don't want to talk about my PTSD. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. If, you look at it, if you pull up his Facebook, he's literally wearing the face mask. You see him on the front lines. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Good dude. Saving lives. Honestly, it's kind of just like more fun to hear from like a guy that was like on the front lines. He has some material about it, but he, he'd rather talk about how he's like a triplet. Stuff like that. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's that thing like where it's like, ah, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll talk about him being a triplet. Um, who else? <laughs> I bet uh, I could get Riley on. Um, just comics that are my friends that are i mean patrick hasty would probably do it in a second do you know patrick I don't. oh do you know oh let's get some women sarah kennedy and genevieve rice are both fantastic i'll, 
I'll send you both of their Facebooks right now. If you're looking for guests, Sarah actually started a podcast that went like stupid viral out of nowhere uh, called Tadar about uh, Taylor Swift being a lesbian, like <laughs> building a case on how she's a lesbian. And it got insane viral right out of the bat. She's very, very funny too. Um, and Genevieve, Genevieve started the uh, fest in Arizona, the Bird City Comedy Fest. Okay. So she's she's like the go-to person in Arizona. I'd say these three are good, but if you need more people, happy to recommend. For sure. Uh, I just think these three would all be very good guests for what this show is. Okay. Oh, she lives in Phoenix. Cool. Yeah. If you want more, I could probably give you like 30 right now. But I yeah. Those, do you want more? I. I've got nothing going on. My wife is with her family. I'm just joking. Yeah, shoot, shoot a list of names over and then we'll watch their stuff. Okay. And then figure out like topics and stuff like that. Because I'm looking to book out the rest of the year. Oh, uh, Tori Piskin would be really good. Jerron Young, David Spector. I'm just literally just on Facebook. Yeah. Marin is really good. Um, did, should I just send you their names? Yeah. And then I'll look them up. David Spector, Matt Maron. Matt Maron's the guy that runs all the Comedy Fight Club roast battles in mm. New York. And he's great. Uh, Tori Piskin. Are you still, uh, I, I know Caroline's is done till next year. Are you going back with them? or? I don't know. Lewis has been kind of tight-lipped about it. Lewis's dog passed away. Ah. Uh. As dude, well. get Lewis on the pod. Lewis is the most fascinating weirdo ever. Dude, he's an enigma. I love Lewis, man. Hey, hey, man. Hey, bro. <laughs> I honestly feel, you know, he sort of like discovered Adam Sandler. I feel like Adam Sandler's kind of doing Lewis a little bit. Yeah, I can oh, see no. that for sure. Just the tiniest bit. Um, let's... Oh, this guy's got to be pretty old then, huh? Lewis Veranda, yeah, yeah, he's the he's the GM at, at Caroline's. He's not ah. he's not a comic. No. Oh, Pete Burdett is good. The Raybold brothers. Uh, Brett and Jordan Raybold. Oh, I've heard Brett Raybold did a uh, his wedding bit, his uh, like maid of honor speech. It's amazing, yeah. Brett's one of the, Jake Silberman. He's from Portland really funny this guy just released a crowd work hour i believe okay See, i have mad respect for somebody who can do that much time on crowd work. oh ben wasserman is the best of all i'm putting him in all caps because he would be your best guest i have i've had him in a sketch one of the funniest yeah uh hannah boone luke modis do you know joe zimmerman not i don't know him but i know i've seen him obviously why I'm, doesn't he like i'm so shocked that he's not getting booked uh, headlining clubs across the country he's too small there's nothing interesting about him either <sighs> he's there's so not, funny though his andrew jackson bit is like so dude, good the one thing i've learned from caroline's you gotta have a thing yeah like i became the cancer guy i don't yeah i couldn't say anything about joe zimmerman yeah other than he's funny which is not a thing yeah. Having a thing is like 50% of the battle. Same with like Joe Mackey. Yes. People are like, I'm a boring white guy. And I'm like, yeah, that's a problem. Like, <laughs> there are so like, many of you. How do I fix that? I'm like, well, you know, Tim Dillon fixed it and he's incredible and became a headliner. Like, you just got to figure out what is, I mean, they say finding your voice, but I think it's more like, what is your thing? that separates you from everybody else. Mm. You, need yeah. a, you need a thing. Like uh, there, this guy that I'm writing to you right now, he's the clapping guy. We all know that he does bits where he claps. That's like his thing. Like all of his yeah. bits are dead like this. Like it's, we know what we're going to get. Like it's, it's interesting. It's like you're going to a restaurant and you know what you're going to get as opposed to like, this is bland kind of thing. Like Joe Zimmerman, right. great, but you're going to walk out and you're going to be like, 
I guess he was funny. He was just kind of like this quiet, bookish man kind of thing. It's a good point. Yeah, you got to have a thing. Like, so what would you say, like, Joe List's thing is? Like, how how is he headlining and, and at, you know, posting a special nerd. that kills? Yeah, nerd and kind of a perv, too. Yeah. Yeah. I will say Mark Norman, his voice is so weird that I think it stands out. Hey! Hey, we all do it. Yeah. yeah. Everyone in New York, that's another one. Sort of like the TIG going, hello. Yeah. Like, became a thing. The Mark Norman voice. Comedy. <laughs> Dude, it's just so fun. Like if you start talking like him, it's fun. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the thing too, I think. You can't laugh at that. Uh, special thanks to Matt Levy for joining us today. It was a lot of fun. We we got off topic, but who cares? We had fun. I feel yeah. like that... we still covered everything though, too. We did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. We covered everything. Where's uh where's <laughs> I don't even know who works there. Where's Lucille? Um <laughs> That's that's my impression of Lewis. That, uh, um, it's his cousin. Uh, I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> He's always in the coat room. I'm tired. <laughs> Why am I so tired? Lucille's the know. most beloved too. <laughs> she's a she's a high school she's a high school girl that never grew up, and I love her. Yeah. She's like a gossiper, big time. Well said. Yeah. Yes. But but there's something so like lovable about her. She was this little old lady who just hung coats. <laughs> That'll be five dollars. And made bank. Yeah. And her husband was killed in front of her. So that's cool. Wait, what? <laughs> At least that's the rumor, but he was he was he had mafia ties. Mm. I did not put that. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Caroline's had some weird drama behind the scenes. Oh yeah, man. Well, whenever <laughs> Trust me. Wrap this up so I can stop recording and we can. All right. So I think we figured out that, you know, uh, it's other people's experience of the, the, whatever the topic is, you know, that I think I worded it better earlier. Maybe we'll move that clip <laughs> to the end. Uh, but essentially, what we're trying to say and what our mission is on this podcast is to prove that no matter how personal, no matter how effective, no matter how offensive it may be, you can laugh at that. That's a wrap. Nice and done. Scene. Scene. Special thanks to Gold Knox Studio. You can find Gold Knox Studio for all your podcasting needs at goldenoxstudio.com. Uh, hit up Jeremy. He is fantastic to work with, a professional. Uh, he makes podcasting easy. And uh, if you're if you've been kicking the tires on starting your own podcast, definitely give Gold Knox Studio a look. If you'd like to weigh in on today's topic, follow us on Twitter at You Can't Laugh Pod, or like us on Facebook at You Can't Laugh at That, and tell us how you did laugh at today's topic or how you didn't. This is all about the conversation, is what I'm saying. All right, bye. You can't laugh at that.